Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Norcross, along with Luke Doris. This is podcast number 14 of Hurricane Season 2021 and podcast number 70 in our series. So, Luke, it's been amazingly quiet in the tropics since our last podcast, like Mother, Mother Nature decided she'd had enough for a while. And boy, is that good to say after this has been tied for the third busiest season on record and then just out of steam, taking a big nap. It's it's great. It's like a switch was turned off. It's uh, It really is. It's just so fascinating how that happens. I, I was talking to Dr. Phil Klotzbach about this just the other day, and I don't know. It just seems like something has to be on a fine line, you know, to have, it couldn't be 10 things that have to all go one direction. They wouldn't go all direction, one direction at the same time. You know what I mean? It's a, such yeah. a interesting uh, phenomenon about why, uh, why this kind of thing happens. Well, today we have a great podcast. We're going to talk with the amazing and forever young Dr. Neil Frank the former director of the National Hurricane Center, of course. Neil was the Hurricane Center director longer than anyone who's ever done it. I've always said Neil was the first modern director of the Hurricane Center, not to take anything away from Grady Norton or Gordon Dunn or Bob Simpson, who came before, but Neil changed the job. He realized that direct communications with the public was the key to getting the message out. He became a well-known feature on TV, setting the standard for what we expect from the National Hurricane Center today. After Neil uh, left the Hurricane Center for 20 years, he was a chief meteorologist at the CBS station in Houston. And uh, so Luke, he was kind of actually one of us uh, as well. What a, what a career. Um, in just a few minutes, we'll talk with the always interesting and always amazing 90-year-old Dr. Neil Frank. So Luke, uh, I just can't imagine the National Hurricane Center not being public facing in a major way. I mean, it would be it would really be so difficult for us if if they didn't have so much effort to uh, communicate and and provide information in a way we can handle it. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, one just from us, from them mm -hmm. to us is huge and breaking down what they see, which they do in so many different ways. But then the other thing is you need a North Star. A, something to point to as the authority and whatever a big situation is. I mean, we've seen that in COVID and you see that with a big weather event and uh, the Hurricane Center plays that role very, very nicely. And especially in a world that is so full, you know, we're in the social media age and imagine if there wasn't that authority, everybody trying to jockey for a position mm -hmm. to get their message out. The message would be indecipherable. It'd be overload from too many different sources, too many different people saying it too many different ways. So you have to have that. And and we certainly do. And the Hurricane Center does a fantastic job. Yeah, when there's a hurricane, I mean, people trust the National Hurricane Center. I wish the National Weather Service actually uh, had a profile that was high enough. So when it's a dangerous situation, but not a hurricane, that, that there's a similar sort of voice for extreme uh, weather that the hurricane that the National Weather Service in general doesn't quite fill in our society in the same kind of way. It's interesting you say that. Uh, I, I watch weather coverage from all over the country and I watch uh, whenever there was the tornado outbreak that we had earlier this week in Oklahoma and mm -hmm. I thought oh okay this is a good time let's watch uh, let's watch Dallas and let's watch Oklahoma City. I interned at a station in Oklahoma City and I was watching and this isn't unique to that station but they will say that they're issuing their own tornado warning. Yes, have, I know this is a problem yeah. in Oklahoma. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they'll have a live video from a right. chaser, or even from a chopper. They chase tornadoes and choppers right. there, yeah. and they'll see one, and they'll they'll issue their own tornado warning. And you, you, you could make arguments either way, I suppose. But you're, it goes to your point of the National Weather Service, and you know how is it's different than the Hurricane Center in their voice to the yeah. public. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a problem um, that. It would be nice if, if it, that could be changed over time. And and actually, I know people are thinking about it, talking about it, and really want it to, to uh, work that way. So we're recording this podcast on Wednesday, October 13th, to 2021. If you're listening at some point in the future in South Florida, of course, you tune into Channel 10. Or you get Local10.com anywhere, and you can watch the Local 10 newscasts. Uh, live on the website anytime for free. And the Max Tracker Hurricane app will keep you up to date on the tropical information and the Local 10 Weather Authority app 
always has the current weather information. And if you go to local10.com slash hurricane, you can sign up for the newsletter from me. It's called From Brian Norcross. Scroll down in the middle of the page under the picture of the Local 10 weather team, and you put in your email, and we'll email it to you every day if there's something going on in the tropics. And even though the tropics have calmed down, there's still been something every day, so you would be getting an email uh, every morning. So, uh, Luke, let's talk about what's going on right now. I mean, there's next to nothing. There's this obvious low-pressure system east of the Bahamas, that is not really a tropical system at all. I think it's induced by the the big upper low that's kind of over the Bahamas. Um, but the Hurricane Center is putting 10% chance on it just because it's over the warm tropical water for a little while for the next day or so, I guess, no more. Uh, we're recording this on Wednesday, so maybe through tomorrow that it might get a little tropical. But probably that's not. it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's interesting to compare what we with this blitz of a season that we've had. And you go back to 2005 or last year where everything that had a little bit of an ignition switch, it spun yeah. and maybe we're off to the races. Not the case this year as we've had disturbances and a good number of them. I mean, earlier was it this weekend or earlier this week? The shear's been higher, hasn't it? The upper level winds are kind of. I mean, lately I'm talking about now, just you know, in this last couple of weeks since the switch got turned off. Uh, you know, it seems like that that the jet stream has dipped farther south, and so we've ended up with just uh, unfavorable upper level conditions, just in general uh, across the tropical areas or across all the systems they kind of wanted to develop. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a, a favorable environment for these things to want to get going, which is great. But, uh, you know, we do see Pamela. So the Eastern mm -hmm. Pacific is still kind of kicking a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, is it, you know, with a, the wave, the MJO that goes around, mm -hmm. we've talked about that a couple times on the podcast where the, the Pacific's got a little bit of help and that's suppressing the Atlantic. Is that what you think is happening? Well, yeah, the MJO was in a very suppressive phase, and, and um, there's no question that had something to do with it. But all that does is it limits the development of systems. It doesn't eliminate the development of systems. So I, it's more than one thing, you know, and it's probably a set of random things that came together. The MJO is supposed to come around and become more supportive for development in the Atlantic late in the month we'll see but not in a strong way um not in a super strong way so uh but it should like let the lid off uh later on in the month but well it's like good said, to see seems you know? like there's more than more than that going on i don't know to me this is a big area for uh, understanding that we lack <laughs> at the moment because i haven't seen you know you like i and many people that listen to this podcast follow twitter um, weather Twitter very carefully, and I haven't seen anybody come up with a a convincing reason why all of the sudden there is nothing uh, that is able to to organize in the tropics, you know. And and uh, you just know those people that are posting on there all the time are thinking about that. So sure. that tells me they don't have any uh, any good thoughts. So anyway, thankfully, and wouldn't it be wonderful if if uh, we didn't get any more. You know, there have been, I looked it up in the last 50 years, there have been four hurricane seasons uh, that ended. So this one, technically, October 25th was the end of Sam when it became extratropical, became just a North, North Atlantic wintertime type storm. On October 5th, um, uh, Victor uh, died on the 4th. So four times the hurricane season ended before that. But there was no season that was super active like this. Uh, they were kind of El Nino kind of suppressed seasons overall uh, that, you know, ended late, late September, early October. Sure. Well, bodes well that we're getting this late in the season. I mean, to try to get the engine restarted at the end of October or early November could happen, but... Eh, yeah, things are yeah, yeah down. it becomes less likely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It becomes less likely. So anyway, good news for us. So uh, let's bring in former National Hurricane Center Director, Dr. Neil Frank. Hi, Neil. Great to see you. Welcome to the podcast. Well, delighted to be here. 
So, Neil, you were a kid in Kansas where I can't imagine you experienced many hurricanes, but ended up at my school, Florida State, to get your master's and Ph.D. in meteorology. So how did a kid from the high plains like Luke here become a hurricane guy? I backdoored into meteorology. That's the way. No, Brian, I wanted to become a basketball coach. I played basketball and tennis through college and had every intention of becoming a basketball coach. And I ran into the chemistry professor the second year on the campus. He said, Neil, you got to come over and major in science. And no, 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 I'm not interested. He said, let me tell you something. If you major in science, then you can become a science teacher, basketball coach, and you that'll give you competitive edge over all your friends that are phys <laughs> ed <me. laughs> okay. So that's the way I got into science. And when I was a senior in college, I found out the Air Force was looking for science majors to go into their meteorology program, then that sounded better than two years in the Army. So I signed up real quick. And I have to confess to you, I really didn't know what meteorology was all about because I didn't work hard at the science. And then I found out that meteorology wasn't the study of meters at all, but it was weather <laughs> forecasting. And if I'd have known at that time that eventually I had to spend years there at the Hurricane Center, I maybe had selected the army i don't know <laughs> yeah i don't i don't know about that so so you were at fsu with the original guys uh, they were still there right dr Leo, neil lasur taught uh, tropical meteorology yeah, right. tom gleason right. was my advisor actually yeah. and uh, chuck jordan was there i remember those three were three right. key people in my time there they were among the founders of the department going back to the the 50s what do you remember about your days at uh, Florida State, uh, because you were there for your master's and PhD. Absolutely. It was an exciting time. Chuck Jordan was my major professor, but I was very close to Nolan Sir. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, Brian, is that these people had come out of the school at Chicago and they studied under Herbie Real. Right. Now, young people don't recognize probably that name, but if you're an old timer, you recognize that Herbie Real was very, very important in the early days of tropical meteorology. Yeah, and Bill it's, Gray's life as well, as a matter of fact. Exactly. Bill used to tell me about Herb Real. Even, even Bill Gray trained under, under right. Herbie Real. And that group then moved down to Florida State, and then they became they came on down to the Hurricane Center once I, once I left for Florida State. Every summer, uh, mm -hmm. J Jordan and LeSueur were down there, and uh, and that's when I met Bill Gray, of course, and he came down at that time. So Florida State was very orientated towards tropical meteorology at the time that I was there. Yeah, I think led by uh, Noel LeSueur, I think, was the, he's the, the main tropical guy there. Uh, at least in my time, he was. He The other ones, uh, Chuck Jordan and, and Tom Gleason, had become more administrative by the right. time I got there, I think. So right. did you go directly from FSU to the Hurricane Center? Or I guess it was called the Miami Hurricane Warning Office uh, uh, at the time. Is that right? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, when I was finishing up my master's degree, the, uh, the NOAA, that, well, the, weather, the National Weather Service, encouraged me to come down and work at the Hurricane Center in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And I, so I went down there and worked in the research unit for two summers. And it was a great deal, but they said, we'll give you, uh, you go down and work in the summertime, and then we'll keep you on the records. And then, of course, when I graduated, um, that's where I went. And I joined the the um, the Hurricane Center. As you said, it wasn't the National Hurricane Center at the time, but I joined it in 1961 when Hurricane Carla made landfall in Texas. So tell us how hurricanes were forecast back then, because this is way before computer models, right? So was it using persistence, or how did you guys do it back then? We drew a lot of maps <laughs> <laughs> that most of you don't do today, but we plotted the maps not only at the surface, but in the upper level. In the 500 millibar, that's about 20,000 feet. 500 millibar became a very important level for steering the hurricanes. And so we plotted our maps up and, and we had some, um, some objective ways that we would kind of move uh, hurricanes forward. And we were very much in tune with, uh, with the weather. And of course, we had reconnaissance at the time, but we were just beginning to see the radar, the coastal radar. As a matter of fact, I think that Hurricane Carla in 1961 was the first time 
that we saw a good presentation of radar on on television. Um, and then there was no With Dan Rather radar. actually is the one Dan who aimed the camera at the radar, right? And yeah, and and he was the first one to put a live radar on television. Mm -hmm. And of course, Dan Rather made his reputation here in Houston, standing mm -hmm. on the seawall during Hurricane Carlin. Right. And uh, Dan Rather worked at Channel 11 at one time. So I he was a news very, director, I think, at, uh, at one time there, wasn't he? Yeah. So I became very acquainted with him. And every mm -hmm. time he'd come to town, he'd always come back and, mm -hmm. and talk to me about hurricanes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But well, there has to be an advantage to forecasting that way, you know, drawing the maps yourselves, really getting intimate. You know, a lot of a lot of us today, you just you, you look at a brief satellite picture or you look at satellites a lot. Don't get me wrong. But then you go straight to the models and you're just not as involved as you guys were back then. At least, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, a majority of us aren't. I'm sure that there are still some that use a lot of those practices, but that's got to really cement uh, what's happening in the atmosphere. But, uh, you know. Did you remember what you were thinking about technology at the time? Did you think there was some big advancement around the corner, uh, you know, like satellites, or could you even envision models at the time? Well, of course, there was no models when I started. In the late 60s, we began to see the bare tropic model, a very simple model, but it wasn't something that we could really depend on very much. And of course, then the late, in the mid to late 60s, we saw satellite pictures and the old Tyros pictures of uh, Luke, uh, you know, the Taros pictures, what, 45 degree angle with the equator and orbited around the either. So you only got to see the area once and once a day. Um, and I, I worked a lot. I, as a matter of fact, uh, Brian, if you remember right, they had a readout station, Wallops Island, Virginia. Right, of course. Yeah. I encouraged them to make a Polaroid of their satellite pictures and then send it down to me. <laughs> and so at the end of every week, I get this package of solar uh, <laughs> Polaroid pictures. And let me tell you, they were black and white. There were no grays on those pictures. And I would piece those together and go in and, and identify some of the weather systems that we were seeing in the eastern part of the Atlantic. Well, that um, was how some, in, in some ways, you learned about systems that add, were added to the record kind of after the fact, right? Through those... Because those Absolutely. Polaroids become to became very important in the future. Right. That that people looked at those those pictures to really you know know what was happening uh, because it was a different time then in terms of being aware of what was going on across the Atlantic. Yeah, Brian, if you remember right, I was the first one to put together a seasonal summary of the African disturbances, and I think that was 1967. And so by then we were beginning to see the full disc pictures. And so I tracked these hurricanes all the way across. And it was kind of interesting. You know the name Bob Simpson. And of course, Luca, you probably don't recognize that. But that was the, that was the director of the National Hurricane Center when I was there. As a, as a matter of fact, I served as his deputy for several years. And so I, I spent a lot of time tracking all these, all these storms, these African disturbances across mm -hmm. the Atlantic. And I had this paper all ready to publish. And he says, you know, I think we ought to write a paper on uh, these African disturbances. I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, let me show you what I've done. And he said, well, I'll co-author with you. So he <laughs> wrote the first paragraph <laughs> and I published the paper. So it's Simpson and all that got credit for uh, it. <laughs> You know, well, the story of the Saffir Simpson scale is not a whole lot different than that. When Herb Saffir went in and showed it to Bob Simpson and, That's right. and said, let's add uh, add a little stuff and we'll call the Saffir Simpson scale. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so, you know, yeah, I've exactly. read hurricanes. Ryan, yeah, go ahead, Neil. Yeah, you and Luke would be interested. See, I was there when the Saffir Simpson scale was developed. Mm -hmm. And in the original Saffir Simpson scale, remember we had central pressure and the wind. Right. And we relied very much on central pressure. And Luke, you would appreciate this. When the reconnaissance plane flew out in the early days, even the 60s and the early 70s, they looked down at the ocean from 10,000 feet and estimated the wind. They didn't go down and measure the wind, but they did drop a drop sound out. So without question, the most accurate indication of how strong the storm was the central pressure. And once we developed, uh, if you look at the uh, Saffir Simpson scale, the uh, pressure wind relationship that we developed for years and years of study of landfalling storms was embedded in that Saffir Simpson scale. Mm 
-hmm. And uh, all of the, up until probably 1990, all of the past hurricanes for 150 years have been, have been categorized on the Saffir Simpson scale by central pressure, not wind. Right. And now they use the pressure wind relationship and so are the more sophisticated version of that. But, but uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, I've read the hurricane center advisories from a number of the great hurricanes of the sixties, like Donna and Carla right. and Cleo and, and Betsy. And I'm always struck on how short they are just a few That's paragraphs, right. but so clear, <laughs> right? Yeah. What was, what was the philosophy back then and how did that evolve? Well, the philosophy was that when we told you heard it's coming, you'd ought to know what you're going to do. <laughs> we don't have to go into all the details of now you need to go to your kitchen and you need to do this and you need to do that. And you're right. We would put out a hurricane warning for a coastal storm that was making landfall, you know, like Andrew is 92. Mm -hmm. uh, we, it, it, back in the 60s, we would put out an advisory that at the most we had to pay two paragraphs to it. And we yeah. just depended on people responding. We said, okay, Urgent here, take yeah. action. And now then we've got five pages and six pages. And Luke, you would appreciate that. Uh, you don't have time to sit down and read five or six or seven pages. So what you do is you go to the advisory and pick out a few key points. <laughs> That's all you have time to do. And so I'm not sure that we're, we're doing a good public service by putting out this big, big catalog of an advisory. Yeah, it was a great thing when the advisory would start. Hoist hurricane warnings from Key West to Vero Beach or something like that. It would, That's you know, right. and just the, the using the verbs to hoist the warnings. Of course, was very, very, you know, reminiscent of what they did back in the day when they were communicating by putting a flag on a pole uh, at the <laughs> port or something like that. But anyway, that was a, always a wonderful part of the advisory. So, how did the Miami office work with New Orleans and the other offices? to forecast hurricanes when, when you got uh, to Miami. Yeah, in 1967, Luke, I don't know whether you know the history or not, but the National Hurricane Center, as we know it today, was established. And prior to that, there were five hurricane warning offices, one in Puerto Rico, one in Boston, one in Washington, D.C., one in Miami, and one in New Orleans. And each of us had a territory that we were responsible for. So when a hurricane would come across the... Uh, the Caribbean, the New Orleans, the office in Puerto Rico would handle it. Then they would turn it over to the Miami office as it moved through the Keys. And then we would turn it on over to the New Orleans office as it made landfall in the Western Gulf of Mexico. And so we had the hurricane uh, forecasters at that time was just a secondary task. We, our primary goal in Miami was to issue the forecast for the state and the Marine and so forth. Then when there was a hurricane, we would add on the hurricane advisory to that. Yeah, I remember reading about that in the uh, 35 Labor Day hurricane, how there was some sort of a, a snafu or a delay in communication between uh, the Miami office, I believe, at that it was time a in Washington, D.C., Jacksonville, Jacksonville and D.C., yeah. there was yeah. uh, some sort of a, you know, a mishap that happened there. Mm -hmm. But uh, so tell us, you know, what was your first big hurricane, Neil? Uh, you weren't in Miami for uh, Donna yet, were you? Uh, you were still at Tallahassee and FSU, is that right? Well, see, I worked in the summertime at the Hurricane Research Lab, and I was there in 1960 when, when Donna made landfall. So I was there when that happened, of course, and I was there in 1961 when Hurricane Carla made landfall in Texas. But... Boy, I can remember, uh, you know, I was there at the center working and going down to the forecast office and keeping track of what was going on with Donna. Um, I remember, I can't remember his name, but we had, a, we had another graduate student that was working there with me, and he decided that he needed to go down into the Florida Keys and check out Donna's had come through. Well, he had a rental car, <laughs> and this rental car got swamped. Let me tell you, he never went down and went in another hurricane. That was enough. He went through a, at a motel down there. It was a horrible experience. <laughs> well, well, tell us about those two because they were giant, weren't they? I mean, Donna was big, and then the next year, Carlo was just massive. I mean, uh, what was yeah, that experience Carlo, like? You know, you have hurricanes that are big in size and intensity. Then you have some that are small in size and still intense. And and Hurricane Carla was a huge storm in terms of size, but it was also very intense. It was like a Category 4 storm. 
And the thing that made Carla so difficult, it was moving slow and it would tend to make these loops and these loops might be six or seven or eight or 10 hours. So you would think the storm is moving along the track and then it would go through one of these loops and you weren't sure whether it was moving west or whether it was moving back east. It was a very difficult storm to forecast because we discovered that the central core of the hurricane doesn't move in necessarily a straight line, but it makes these wobbles. And I call them loops and whatever you want to call them, but it really makes it difficult to try to pinpoint where the hurricane is going to make landfall or the eye of the hurricane when you when you see these wobbles take place. Yeah, I remember Carla talking about Carla affecting Louisiana. I mean, it was a, a yep. huge circulation. And you can imagine this was the day 61. That was before satellites, right? So and, so trying to keep track of where a hurricane exactly was, it was crawling through the middle of the Gulf. That would not have been fun. So by late... Well, of course, we had reconnaissance. Oh, true, flight. true, true, true. That's right. right. Of course you did. That's right. So in late um, uh, August of 1964, Hurricane Cleo hit Haiti hard and as a Category 4 and then turned north in the general direction of Florida. And as the storm was approaching uh, Miami the evening of August 26th, the advisories indicated the storm should stay offshore and the worst would be in the Bahamas. Do you remember that? I, I, I remember well, us talking remember? about that night that Cleo suddenly turned right over Miami. Tell us about that. I do remember that well, <laughs> because I was scheduled to work the midnight shift. And so I lived at that time up in by Hallandale. And Luke, you know, that's, you know, what, 30 mm-hmm. miles from, or 20 miles further north. So I was driving to work and man, the winds begin to pick up as I got closer and closer and closer. And I walked in the office and the radar guy says, Neil, you better take this telephone call. <laughs> And I said, well, what's up? And he said, well, he's in Key Biscayne and he's in the eye of the storm. <laughs> so what, this thing's supposed to be offshore, you know. And Gordon Dunn, who was the director at the right. time, had, we were tracking this thing on radar and, and very watch, and we're watching it very closely. And it looked like it was going straight north and right offshore. It made a wobble to the west mm-hmm. and the eye came right over the Key Biscayne. Again. So there was a lot of turmoil really quickly as that storm. Fortunately, it wasn't a big, huge storm uh, like Andrew, right. but it did enough damage to get our attention, that's for sure. Yeah, well, that's very much like the Ida wobble that uh, put worse storms over the uh, New Orleans metro. It just sometimes they wobble. So w- they was wobble. there, yeah, after uh, Cleo, was there an acknowledgement that maybe the language shouldn't be quite so specific? in the advisory? I mean, it was very specific. The storm is going to to stay offshore. Yeah, and uh, this was Gordon Dunn, and he was Mm -hmm. a very good forecaster. I'm surprised he kind of of got caught up in this. Uh, But he was getting a lot of pressure, and it looked like the center was going to pass just to the east of us, Mm -hmm. and we would be in the western fringe. And so he went on television, and he told everybody Mm -hmm. that, and he'd no more finished the broadcast than the eye jumped (laughs) on shore. Um, mm. I know, I, I'm telling you, I've, there, I have a lot of scars <laughs> my, in my career. Of, of the, it seemed like the hurricanes would come right to the coastline, then they'd do something strange. They would strengthen or they'd weaken or they'd wobble or this way or that. And uh, at that time, we didn't have the communications that you have today. Mm-hmm. And it was very difficult then to get that information out to the public. Well, and you were just talking about how you know, this kind of kept happening because the next year there was Betsy. And That's Betsy right. went north. It was just offshore of Cape Canaveral, then comes back down, goes through the Bahamas and South Florida. That had to be crazy. Uh, I wonder, do you think that we would forecast that correctly today? Any thoughts there? Well, I think what the models would tell you is that the storm is moving slow. And is the Betsy moved north of the Bahamas? I think all we didn't have the models there at that time, but I think the models would have shown you that the steering currents are very weak and they would have shown some kind of a little wobble or they would not have moved it very fast. And that would have been a clue that something made change may take place. I think they would have caught the change that forced the storm back into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, whether they would have been able to be that precise whether the storm will pass south of Miami or whether it'll make landfall north of Miami. I don't think they could have done that. But the models would have give you an indication that something is going to change 
and the storm is going to move very slow for the next several hours. And during this whole time, too, there's a really interesting project that was going on. It's called Project Storm Fury. And the idea was to dump silver iodide from airplanes in the hopes of weakening hurricanes. And did that feel like a long shot? I mean, uh, what do you remember about that effort? It, it went on for a long time. Yeah, 1969 particularly was very active. And you remember Carla, uh, Camille hit the Mississippi Coast in 1969. At the same time, if I recall, the storm was named Diane. They were flying the storm ferry missions into Diane out north of, of Puerto Rico. And so it really caused us a lot of problems with, <laughs> with Camille because all of a sudden Camille just plunged in terms of its central pressure. And this thing was really getting serious. Well, all of the recon planes were out there flying into this storm were storm fury. And I remember that the Navy had a, the, uh, the, what was the triple tail? Uh, the Constellation. The, the Constellation. The Connie. Yeah. yeah, they were flying the Constellation. And the Constellation had a great radar uh, sitting underneath the thing. And as they as the Navy crew went out there, and this was one of their spare planes, they flew out there and they took a look at that thing on radar. And they said, we're not going into that. <laughs> so we didn't know how strong it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they abandoned it. And, and Simpson got on the line as to somebody in air weather service and said, we need to get you, get the air crew, the air force air crew turned around so they could get back in that storm. And they did so. And that's when we found out that the pressure was down, I don't know, 904 millibars or something like that. But if that air force hadn't plane gone back in there, we really wouldn't have known. And because that airplane went back in there, uh, Simpson decided to put 20 feet in the forecast of the storm surge. And we had never put 20 feet in any advisory in history. And here's 20 feet. Well, this must be serious stuff. Yeah, that was so Camille. I, that was my first hurricane advisory I ever did in broadcasting was in, in that August weekend, 1969, which was the same weekend as Woodstock. That's right. right. And, and, you know, so there was a lot going on. And the Apollo 11 astronauts were at a, on a parade in Houston. Um, and okay. I only know that from listening to my broadcasts uh, from back then. And the reason that and I was on the radio in Florida and the reason that we were interested in it was because uh, on that Saturday. So the storm hit Sunday night. Right. right. On that Saturday, uh, the hurricane warnings were up for the Florida panhandle. And then right. they kind of had to be quickly adjusted right. to the west. But but. You know, in, in modern times, that would seem like, oh, my goodness, you know, there was a last minute adjustment, but it didn't feel, I don't know, what do you remember? Did you remember like, uh, oh, my God, we got to move the uh, warnings were late on this? Or was it just that the time frames were so much shorter right. back then that that it was just part of the way, you know, hurricanes rolled at that time? Right. Well, we at that time, Luke, you'd be interested in that. We were not putting out. Uh, three and four and five day forecast. Right. Uh, I mean, we were lucky to get the 24 to 36 hours and 48 hours. So, Brian, you're right on that. We weren't telling you what's going to happen in five days and had to make some major adjustments. The main thing I remember with Camille is it moved into the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, it was a hurricane, mm -hmm. but it wasn't something that serious. And this explosive de deepening mm -hmm. is what gave us all the problems as it approached the ghost line. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they ended up finding a 900 millibar pressure, you know, in Mississippi on land. And that's what really is the basis of, of their wind estimate of 175 miles per hour. Um, to, they feel like they confirmed that 900 millibar, which is really stunning. So you became famous later on for taking before and after pictures of of the coastlines so, so before they were hit by hurricanes and after to really talk about how you have to build at the coast to to be resilient did did you do that for camille or did that come later no that was the first uh, that was the first storm that i really used that before and after that's i, I thought i remembered that yeah, yeah. And see, I when I went into Luke in, in after the storm, as soon as everything settled down and I could get out of Miami, then I would fly up and just rent a car. I didn't go down and tell the mayor that I'm going to be there and I'll be there and I'll be, come on out, bring your cameras. I wanted to see what happened, and I wanted to 
talk to the people and say, why didn't you respond? Why did you respond? And take a look at this song. So I got up there and I found out that there was an aerial photographer, a commercial photographer, that had taken a whole series of pictures along the coastline just before Camille. Now, these were these were really nice close-up shots that he could sell to a motel, for example. Mm -hmm. And so when I got up there, I found out that he went out a, a week after the storm and took after pictures. So I had the before and after pictures. Now, they were all in black and white, so we... We got them tinted, and that's why they're in color. If you see them, in really, color. I didn't yeah. know they were tinted. I just thought it was old film. No, no, no. I didn't know that. <laughs> we hired an artist to tint those pictures. That's hysterical. And uh, the Richelieu apartment is probably right. the best well-known before and after picture in the history of hurricane preparedness. Yes, it is. And Luke, I don't know whether you've ever seen that one or not, but there was a three-story apartment complex there. And they had a hurricane party. Well, mm, sort of. the, the question whether the reality of the hurricane party right. has been disputed. I have a book by somebody who survived that. I don't know whether you've seen that or not. Um, but it allegedly they had a hurricane party, and then there was only two survivors. One was Marianne Gerlach, who went out the window when the storm, be when the building began to break apart. Her husband couldn't swim, so he drowned. And then there was a 12-year-old boy, mm -hmm. if I remember right. But there was nothing left the next day but the slab. And then we had the picture of the before and the after. And I went up there a couple of years ago, and it's a park now. <laughs> nothing has ever been built really? on that. Yeah. yeah, that has to be you know invaluable because you, you continued to do that, right? I mean, after Camille, yeah. this is what you you did a lot of this with various hurricanes, correct? Well, absolutely. Immediately after the storm, I would get the recon, uh, a recon plane. Uh, to go up and fly along the coastline at two or three hundred feet and take my 35 millimeter camera and click as many pictures as we can as we fly along there trying to get close-ups and then after i had that whole sequence of pictures then i would go to the the uh, to the local area and see if they had any aerial pictures that i could match and so that's where i got the before and after pictures and so yeah. i did that in every storm that uh, i was involved in including most recently Hurricane Ike here in the, in the Texas area. Yeah, there's nothing more powerful than that, right? You have, As far as a messaging yeah. standpoint of what hurricanes do, I don't think a lot of people that live along the coast know really what a hurricane does. And you show, hey, this is what it was and this is what it became after the storm. Uh, I, I saw that. I went to Michael. I went up uh, to Mexico Beach after Hurricane Michael struck there, and it's just it's unreal. So it's, it it's, is unreal. Uh, that is really powerful. So hey, you brushed on this earlier. Uh, you were talking about uh, the Hurricane Center, and it used to it had a different name before, and it's, it's moved around some. So tell us about the various locations um, across Miami where the Hurricane Center has moved, and, and why did it move, and what were they like? Well, the National Hurricane Center, as we know it today, was established in 1967. Now, keep in mind that the forecasters, all these forecast offices, were products of World War II. And so it came up to the point in the, in the 60s where a lot of these people wanted to retire. At the same time, we were beginning to use computers. And so it was decided that rather than establish computer centers at these five locations, that we would, we would centerize everything there in Miami and bring in people to forecast and replace the ones that were retiring that had advanced degrees in meteorology. And that's where I was able to, uh, to join the force because I was working on that PhD out of Florida State. And so I was one of the forecasters in that original uh, five, I think we had five original hurricane forecasters. That okay, so, so this is whenever you start working for the Hurricane Center. You're not the director yet. Do I have the timeline right? And and the Hurricane Center takes over all the hurricane forecasts. Is that is that correct? Yeah, in, in 1967, we took the responsibility for all hurricanes that affected the Caribbean or the eastern part of the United States. And uh, yes, I was part of that crew that had that responsibility. And not only that, we worked full time on the hurricane in the winter time. We did research and and, uh, and did a lot of uh, presentations, and, and I got involved in, in giving a lot of talks. Uh, the question is, when I would go out to a community, and um, 
I'd find out that not many people knew really what to do. Well, who is responsible for educating them? Uh, you have probably, the, you've got the ear, <laughs> Luke, you've got their ear. And so to a certain extent, it, it falls a responsibility of those people in the media to, to do that. Uh, but oftentimes I found out the people in the media didn't know what was going on either. And yet they were issuing forecasts. So we did a lot of, uh, we did a lot of workshops uh, where we helped to, to train the media as well as, a, I, I can't, Brian, I'm, you'll be interested in this. We did workshops for emergency managers. Now within a community, the responsibility for responding to a, a disaster is the mayor, right? With an oversight of the governor or something like that. Well, he transfers this responsibility down to somebody who's the emergency manager. So I would go to these workshops and have to spend time to train the emergency managers how to plot latitude and longitude so they could, <laughs> so they could locate the earth. Back when we used to do that, yes, that was the thing we did in every advisory, for sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's you how you had some, some idea. So Neil is... is understating a little bit by saying he did a lot of workshops. <laughs> I mean, he, he did a whole lot of workshops. As long as yeah. I've known Neil, um, workshops and training and of every entity involved in the hurricane program was, uh, he set yeah, the standard now, for you that. Asked, yeah, you asked me about, I when the National Hurricane Center was established, I was one of the hurricane forecasters. Then I became the deputy under Bob Simpson in 1973 and then he retired in 1974, and I became the director in 74 and stayed there until 87. Yes, the, the longest running director, I think. Uh, longest in, running director. In this, uh, to anybody so far. So talk about uh, naming storms and how that's changed over the years. We name a lot of storms now. But on the other hand, we have more technology and more accurately detect what's going on inside the storm. So the problem is the historical record is kind of apples and oranges, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, there's three things that I would want to point out. I mean, 2020, we had 30 storms. Um, this breaks the record of 28 in 2005. And previous to that, it was 1933 with 21 storms. Although, Brian, there's a little controversy on that. They've reanalyzed that and they now say 20 storms. Well, whatever it is, 20 or 20, 20 or 21. Um, but what's happening now over the last several years, there has been a major change in the philosophy of what we name. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, the requirement for a hurricane is you have a pre-existing disturbance. There are, let me divide the Atlantic into the deep tropics south of 25 degrees and the subtropics north of 25 degrees. Without question, the most important um, pre-existing disturbance in the deep tropics is the African disturbances. Uh, we follow 40 to 50 of these every year. And it's something to the order of 10 become our named storms. And the energy process is very simple. The uh, disturbance force uh, causes thunderstorms. The thunderstorms heat the atmosphere. The hot air rises and air spins in at the surface. And if it reaches a threshold, we put a name on it. Now, in the subtropics, what I call the subtropics, would be north of 25 degrees, there is a different process. A cold front moves off the coast, stalls, and then a little disturbance forms on that cold front. Now, the energy with that disturbance is not thunderstorms. It's, it's what we call baroclinic energy. In other words, cold air side by side of warm air. So anytime you have cold air and by side to side warm air, the cold air tries to ride under underneath the warm, uh, the warm air and you have wind. So you have a disturbance that has baroclinic energy, but it causes thunderstorms. And these thunderstorms begin to heat the system up. And eventually this system can morph into more of a tropical system. And sometimes it, it's a hurricane. I mean, this is a legitimate uh, process that takes place. Um, but more than likely, this disturbance then as it moves in, and particularly out over the east, uh, over the ocean, as it moves into higher latitudes, it runs into colder water, the thunderstorms dissipate, and it taps into a new source of cold air, and then it becomes a very clinic storm. So what do you do? Do you dename it? Do you continue to call them, 
<laughs> continue the name is this bear clinic storm moves all the way to the north pole you know the, the big dilemma well what what the uh, what's being decided over the last five six seven well more than that but it really has been decided over the last five or six years is that we're going to name those storms and then when they become bear, bear clinic then we dename them and in 2020, we named 10 of those Bear Clinty storms. One of those within a few hours of crouching the Portugal coast. I mean, we named everything that moved in the North Atlantic. Now, we didn't used to do that. I went back through the records and looked in pre, before we had satellites, how many of these Bear Clinty storms did we name? An average of one every two years. And most of the ones we named turned out to be hurricanes. Well, in 2020, we named 10 of these storms. One of them become a hurricane. Uh, the, uh, the term, the shorties, you know, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. lifetime of less than two, two days or something like that right. um, is a term that is used to describe those. And I would submit to you that if we would impose the, uh, the limitations the observing limitations that we had in 1933, in other words, no recon and no satellite. The satellites have been very instrumental in determining hurricanes in the eastern Atlantic beyond mm -hmm. reconnaissance. OK, and so if you if you impose uh, no satellites and no reconnaissance on 2030, there are 13 storms that probably would not have been registered. Maybe one, let's say 12, even 10. Well, take 10 storms away, and 1933 still looks pretty active yeah. with 21 storms. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is that drawing conclusions by the raw hurricane record is, is faulty reasoning. I agree. Yeah, with you. you just can't use the, uh, it, the historical <laughs> records have too many flaws in them. Mm -hmm. Now, over the last five years, we averaged seven storms of these bear clinic storms that I call them in the North Atlantic. And that doesn't include the ones that we put in the Gulf of Mexico. And then you add another three storms in the Eastern Atlantic. So we've added about 10 storms uh, with before, before we had satellites and before we had recon. So what, and, and Ryan, you're absolutely true. I'm at 2020 was active. So this mm -hmm. year was active, mm -hmm. but, uh, I'm not sure it was that much more active than, than the 1933. Luke? Yeah. Um, I I mean, I agree. Uh, things have changed, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just the whole methodology of how we track these things has evolved over the year. And that was the best succinct description I've ever heard of the difference between, you know, the uh, African easterly waves and the deep tropics and hurricanes compared to, you know, the, the stuff that we get that spins up late in the season, these subtropical right. storms. That is great. So, you know, pretty much uh, every National Hurricane Center director after you, Dr. Frank, has added to what you started. It's a great legacy. I'm reading a book right now. It's about leadership. And one of the things that it talks about uh, a whole awful lot is the ability and the need for a leader to step out of a comfort zone. And the benefit of that is it pushes the boundary and everybody around that leader gets elevated. And that really seems to fit you and everything that you brought to the Hurricane Center. So uh, did you go in with the plan uh, to you know, expand into being such a voice for the Hurricane Center? Uh, it, did you just kind of find yourself there over time and it evolved? Uh, how do you look back at that? Um, was that your plan? Well, yeah, you know, I would, with VHD, I'm trained to do research and we had satellites when I joined the Hurricane Center and, and it was exciting to track these African disturbance and what does the satellite picture show? And so I wrote a number of papers on satellites and interpretation of satellites and then I became the director. And I asked my staff, I said, you know, what if we spend the next 10 years, all of our time trying to improve the accuracy of a hurricane forecast? How successful will we be? And most everybody said, if we improve the accuracy 10%, 15%, that would be a real achievement. And I said, well, you know, how many people living along the coastline today have never experienced a major hurricane? So we went and looked at these statistics of every coastal county 
and to look and see how many people were there during the last hurricane. And if I remember the number, something like 40 million people lived along the coastline in the coastal counties. 35 million had never experienced a major hurricane. And that's when I asked my question, well, who is going to teach them and train them and help them make better decisions? And maybe it would be more useful if I spent my time trying to improve the response to the hurricane warning rather than to try to, to improve the technology of the forecast skills. And that's when I got involved and uh, going out into the communities. When I left there, I was averaging about 100 talks a year up and down the coastline, Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, you know. <laughs> uh, but that's where I did the before and after pictures. Mm -hmm. and, and Luke, you get an interest in this. When, you, when I would go out and somebody said, well, what is a hurricane? When I first went out and started giving talks, I took all my meteorological charts and I'd show them a picture and I said, well, this is a hurricane and this is what happens in the winds and so forth. And you, you, you get this dazed look, you know, yeah. and you know what I did? So I said, well, wait a minute, let me show you. You want to know what a hurricane is? Here's the Rich Lou apartments and they had a hurricane party. This is the uh, picture afterwards and 10 people died. Oh, that's what a hurricane is. And the communication is with pictures become very effective. Yeah. And then you took that again because you transitioned into television and uh, you're on yeah. Houston TV as a chief meteorologist for years and years. So was that easy? I mean, you, you're obviously a gifted communicator, but uh, did you feel like a fish out of water at first uh, when you first got going or did you just kind of swim? I wasn't even a fish to get in the water when I first got <laughs> um, you know, look, the thing that that bothered me, and Brian would appreciate this too, when I came in here, they told me I'll have three minutes. They didn't tell me they'd cut time while I was talking. That, I never got comfortable with that. If you give me three minutes, I can go over the sequence, and I pretty much can get it into the three minutes. But as I'm talking, they tell me you cut 30 seconds. It was very, very difficult for me. So the transition into this unknown amount of time that you have for your presentation was the most difficult part that I that I experienced. Yeah, nothing's changed, by the way, <laughs> Neil, in, in that regard for people that, that do TV. So, Neil, before you we let you go, um, our you know great friend and colleague uh, Max Mayfield really wanted to be here. I was going to surprise you by right. having him uh, on oh, with us today, but he had a, he had a commitment and we just couldn't uh, make it work. But he he sent me uh, some notes that I I want to share with you that he, that he wrote. I edited them down a little bit, but I'm going to send you the whole okay. uh, note from Max. So here's what uh, Max uh, had to say. He says, I came to the National Hurricane Center in September of 1972 after graduating from OU and spending a couple of years in the Air Force as a forecaster. Bob Simpson was the director and Neil Frank was the deputy director. So those guys took a chance in hiring me because I was really a tornado and a severe thunderstorm kind of guy. And I didn't really know much about hurricanes. And I'll never forget the first time I heard Neil Frank give a talk on hurricanes at the American Meteorological Society meeting. I think it was in Miami or Miami Beach. He says, I was totally hooked on hurricanes and hurricane preparedness after Neil's presentation. Some of the hurricane forecasters who worked with Neil tell the story of how he would rent a van and take them on a week-long trip looking at vulnerable areas along the coastline. That may sound like a lot of fun, but I remember most of them talking about how Neil would go nonstop from sunrise to sunset, and that van got pretty small by the end of the week, and they all returned home exhausted. Neil's passion for hurricanes was contagious. He understood that better communication between the hurricane forecasters and individuals in harm's way, as well as key local, state, and federal decision makers, was essential. I recall that he used to say if he had time to sit down with everyone living in the hurricane vulnerable areas, that he could convince them it was necessary for them to develop a hurricane plan. Neil is the one who gets the credit for initially making the media feel like a valuable part of the hurricane preparedness team. The media in return helped communicate the hurricane threat more effectively than any one person could ever accomplish. Neil also took communicating directly with the emergency management community and other key decision makers to a new level. 
I believe he was a key asset in helping start some of the local, state, and even national hurricane conferences. One of the most effective ways of communicating the various hazards of the hurricane is by showing before and after pictures. And nothing is more effective in motivating people to repair than seeing what appears to be a well-constructed building built near the coast and then seeing what's left of it after being destroyed by storm surge. Neil has given countless hurricane preparedness talks. I always thought he might be on his deathbed one day and someone would ask if he would give just one more hurricane talk and he'd be willing to get up and do it. I can't think of anyone who's made a larger contribution to our nation's hurricane warning program than Neil Frank. He has certainly made a tremendous positive impact on both my career and my faith in God. And I will always be thankful for him. From our friend Max. That is so nice, Brian. I'm, I'm telling you. You know, let me tell you a story about, uh, about Max. Uh, you know, he had a family and he was working on his on his master's degree, and he came to me and he said, "No, I can't. I just can't do this." I said, "You don't have any option. Mm -hmm. You have to get that degree and get it finished." And because of that, the doors open for him for his career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciate that. You were, you were um, uh, instrumental to him, and and honestly, Neil, you were an inspiration to me in 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 realizing that it was. A, really about communications the forecasts aren't that bad it's really the fact is that that we don't we still don't have a good way to to have people really understand them so neil what's it like to be 90 years old and still going so strong we all want to well, know <laughs> yeah i have 15 great grandchildren and anytime now i may get the telephone call that 16 is here and so with a lot of family around why we stay very active and mm -hmm. and i still uh, we haven't talked about global warming luke <laughs> okay mm -hmm. i'm a, one of the skeptics brian knows that mm -hmm. and uh, i have a powerpoint presentation and and i'm willing to travel invite me and i'll come out and give you a presentation <laughs> wow that's uh it's so impressive neil well best to you and to Velma and your family neil it was uh, just great having you on today and uh, great to see you after all these years well, Luke, let me say about that, Brian, I've been so impressed with uh, with our relationship with Brian and down through the years. He's done a great job and, and I really admire him and the career that he has had and the impact that he's had on hurricanes and television. Mm -hmm. And so, Brian, I really appreciate all that you've done, too. Thank you, Neil. Maybe I'll say that about you someday, Luke. If I can <laughs> oh, I don't know, man. I mean, Brian, I, I have the same sentiment you do. Uh, Brian has been such an inspiration to me and uh, this whole community in South Florida, everywhere he goes, he just he's, he's just got a lot of weight, a lot of power. And he's uh, he's an incredible person. So I'm so thankful to be able to know him and work with him. And uh, it's been great. And it introduces me to incredible people like you, Dr. Frank. Uh, you. Without Brian, you and I may not be having this conversation, and I'm so thankful for that as well because you're an incredible person, and uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you. The legendary and extraordinary Dr. Neil Frank, National Hurricane Center Director from 1974 to 1987. Luke, we should all keep going like Neil at 90 years old. Unbelievable. <laughs> we should all be going like Neil when we're 30. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's so capable so accomplished and i'm always captivated by people like him that can use both sides of their brain so well he's uh he's unsuspecting in his intelligence and what all he knows because you talk to him he's common as a shoe <laughs> and he just breaks things down so simply but i guess it's those that understand a topic most deeply that can explain it most clearly and he he does that he's he's incredible yeah i hope that his memories are somehow preserved because I mean, he is just the walking history of the National Hurricane Center. If you think about it, not that many people can tell you about Hurricane Cleo and what was going on within the National Hurricane Center during Hurricane Cleo in 1964 in Miami, you know, or Donna mm -hmm. or or Carla or any of those uh, storms you know, of that era. So oh, anyway, he's an amazing guy. Neil has such a tremendous legacy, laying the groundwork for so many things we do today. I learned a tremendous amount from watching Neil. He spoke so clearly and to the point without getting wrapped up in meteorological terms. It was uh, 
great to talk with him here again. Now, if you are listening on your phone or on the podcast app and you'd like to see a video version of the podcast and see how Neil is doing at 90 years old, we have a video version for you too. Just go to local10.com slash hurricane. On the right side of the page, you'll see our last several podcasts there. You can click for an audio version or a video version, either one. So next week, we're going to be talking to Jim Carrier, the prolific author who wrote a book called The Ship and the Storm about the loss of the passenger ship uh, Phantom in Hurricane Mitch. It's an amazing and incredibly sad story, Luke. It is. I read this book twice. It's the kind of book that sticks with you. Um, it's a big range of emotions, and it's. I can't imagine anything more horrifying than being on a ship and caught in the middle of a incredibly powerful hurricane like Mitch was. And uh, Jim is is going to walk us through that tale as we go to next week. It'll be one to listen to. It will be. And I remember Hurricane Mitch. I mean, I worked Hurricane Mitch, and boy, the and then and which is really the story. The forecasts were terrible. For yeah. it, it uh, they were, it was constantly forecast to come north, and it didn't come north. It's it's uh, it's a lesson for sure. So that's next week, and the week after next, we're going to have the director of the National Weather Service, Dr. Louis Cellini, back on the podcast. Louis has announced that he'll retire early next year after a long, eventful, and extremely successful career in meteorology and at the very top of the weather enterprise in the United States. So it'll be. Fantastic talk to him. We thought it would be a perfect time to talk to him about his career and what's ahead for him and the National Weather Service. That's in two weeks. So be sure you subscribe to our podcast on your Apple or Android app so you get notified when a new podcast is online. Or, of course, you can watch Twitter or Facebook as well. For now, for Luke Doris, I'm Brian Norcross. Stay safe, be well, hope you're vaccinated, and we'll see you here next week. <laughs>